But when we concluded uh, Daniel chapter 3 last week, it was with a proclamation made by King Nebuchadnezzar. It was addressed to, as he modestly puts it, everybody on earth. <laughs> and this proclamation was essentially ordering all of his subjects, who he reckoned was every last soul on the planet, to show respect for the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a God that the king currently called the Most High God. Now, Most High God, those words, are an Eng a dynamic English translation of the Arama Aramaic word ile that in Hebrew is El, which means the highest God, usually of a pantheon of gods and, and goddesses. So as a result of the king's experience of having watched these three Jewish lads miraculously emerge from the superheated furnace, unscathed, he wanted to honor their God, who rescued them by naming him the Ile God, the Most High God. But as I pointed out last time, just like the ethics and morals and opinions of politicians change with the weather, so does the pecking order of the many gods of ancient cultures. On the day of this proclamation letter from the king, it was the unnamed God of the three Jews that Nebuchadnezzar called the God Most High. And in a few months, probably less, he'd drop that and designate another God as Most High. I also want to point out that some Bible versions will put the final three verses of Daniel chapter 3 as the first three verses of Daniel chapter 4. I could make a case for that either way, but it doesn't matter. The Bible wasn't divided into verses and chapters until hundreds of years after the a biblical canon was formulated and it was closed. And they were created for little more than a convenient way to study the Word of God and to communicate it to others. So generally speaking, they do no harm. Let's read Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1103. Daniel chapter 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was contentedly living at home, enjoying the luxury of my palace, but as I lay on my bed, I had a dream which frightened me. It was followed by fantasies and visions in my head which frightened me even more. So I ordered all the sages of Babel to present themselves to me so that they could tell me the interpretation of the dream. And when the magicians and exorcists and astrologers and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they couldn't interpret it for me. Finally, however, Daniel renamed Belshazzar after the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, came before me, and I told him the dream. And Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the meaning of the visions I saw in my dream. Here are the visions I had in my head as I lay on my bed. I looked, and there before me was a tree at the center of the earth. It was very tall. And the tree grew and it became strong until its crown reached the sky. It could be seen from anywhere on earth. Its foliage was beautiful. Its fruit abundant. It produced enough food for everyone. The wild animals enjoyed its shade. The birds in the air lived in its branches. It gave food to every living creature. I looked in the visions of my head as I lay on my bed, and there appeared a holy watcher coming down from heaven. And he cried out, Cut down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit. Let the wild animals flee from its shelter, let the birds abandon its branches, branches, but leave the stump 
with its roots in the ground, with a band of iron and bronze, in the lush grass of the countryside. Let him be drenched with dew from the sky and share the lot of animals in the pasture. Let his heart and mind cease to be human and become those of an animal, and let seven seasons pass over him. This order is issued by the watchers. The sentence is announced by the holy ones, so that all who live may know that the Most High rules the human kingdom, that he gives it to whomever he wishes, and he can raise up over it the lowliest of mortals. This is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. Now you, Belshazzar, tell me its interpretation. None of the sages of my kingdom can tell me the interpretation, but you can do it. Because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Now Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was in shock for a while, frightened by his thoughts. And the king said, Belshazzar, don't let the dream or the interpretation frighten you. And Belshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream were about those who hate you and the interpretation about your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, till its crown reached the sky and it could be seen throughout the whole earth, that had that had beautiful foliage, abundant fruit, enough to feed everyone under which the wild animals lived, on whose branches the birds in the air built their nests. It's you. It's you, your majesty. You have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven. Your rule extends to the end of the earth. Now the king saw a holy watcher coming down from heaven who said, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump with its roots in the ground with a band of iron and bronze and the lush uh, grass of the countryside. Let him be drenched with dew from the sky and share the lot of the wild animals until seven seasons pass over him. This is the interpretation of that, your majesty. It is the decree of the Most High that has come upon the Lord, my King. You will be driven from human society. Live with the wild animals. You will be made to eat grass like an ox and be drenched with dew from the sky as seven seasons pass over you until you learn that the Most High rules in the human kingdom and He gives it to whomever He pleases. But since it was ordered to leave the stump of the tree with its roots, your kingdom will be kept for you until you have learned that heaven rules everything. Therefore, your majesty, please take my advice. Break with your sins by replacing them with acts of charity. Break with your crimes by showing mercy to the poor. This may extend the time of your prosperity. All of this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babel, the king said, Babel the Great, I built it. As a royal residence of my power, my force to enhance the glory of my majesty. No sooner had the king spoken these words when a voice came down from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, these words are for you. The kingdom has left you. You will be driven from human society to live with the wild animals. You will be made to eat grass like an ox. Be drenched with dew from the sky as seven seasons pass over you until you learn that the Most High rules in the human kingdom and gives it to whomever he pleases. Within the hour, the word was fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers his nails like bird's claws. And when this period was over, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes towards heaven and my understanding came back to me. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and gave honor to him who lives forever. For his rulership is everlasting. His kingdom endures through all generations and all who live on earth are counted as nothing. He does what he wishes with the army of heaven, with those living on earth. No one can hold back his hand or ask him, what are you doing? It was at that moment that my understanding came back to me. And for the sake of the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor also came back to me. My advisors and lords sought me out. I was reestablished in my kingdom and to my 
previous greatness, even more was added. So now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of Heaven. For all of his works are truth, his ways are just, and he can humble those who walk in pride. <clears throat> this is probably as difficult a chapter as there is in, in Daniel to properly study and to understand. So I would like to again remind you that we are still in the portion of Daniel that was written in Aramaic, the language of the Gentile world at that time. And also that the thoughts and the speech that we're, we're hearing from the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar are the thoughts of a pagan. They are spoken in, the, in his multiple God worldview. To inject Hebrew thought or Christian thought into it is an error from the aspect of how Nebuchadnezzar viewed it. Nonetheless, since this dream and vision was from the God of Israel, <clears throat> we have to look past the way the king thought about it, the way he described it, and instead discover what the Lord intended to convey. So getting to the best interpretation without adding too much <clears throat> speculation is a dicey matter. Many Bible scholars, especially Christian denominational leaders, are used to and demand nice, neat doctrines drawn with sharp lines. So sometimes we'll read rigid and, and rather simplistic commentary on this portion of Daniel, but it misses the mark substantially. The reality is that on some matters, like in Daniel 4, we're just not going to be able to be quite as, de as definite or definitive as we'd like to be. Here's what we see from these verses. King Nebuchadnezzar has it made in the shade. He explains that he was content, happy, he was enjoying life, the luxury of palace, and he was glorifying himself and the accomplishments of having created the largest empire the world had ever known. His empire was at peace. It was operating like clockwork. Every race, language, tribe, and ethnic group of the scores of kingdoms and nations that formed his enormous and diverse empire had sworn allegiance to the one world government of Babylon, and therefore to Nebuchadnezzar by means of that empire-wide ceremony of the dedication of that golden statue, that one that nearly cost Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego their lives. So the idea is that the king was under no stress, no particular anxiety, because, according to him, things were good. He was relaxed. And then suddenly, from nowhere, comes a troubling series of dreams. But that wasn't all. These dreams were followed up with visions, which means he was receiving this message both while he was sleeping and while he was awake. He couldn't escape it. Now this bothered him. So naturally he called together all of his Chaldean seers to interpret his, his dream to calm him down. Now notice the differences this time versus the earlier time when he sought interpretation about the frightening dream of the statue that consisted of the four different metals. First, the dream about the statue happened very early in his reign, when his empire wasn't fully under control. <clears throat> he had governing problems. He wasn't sure if he'd ever be able to achieve the stable empire that he sought. So he was no doubt unsettled in his thoughts, agitated in his spirit. And second, 
as a test of their ability to tell him the truth, the king demanded that his Chaldean seers not only tell him the meaning of the dream about the statue, but the actual content of that dream itself. They failed, of course, and if not for Daniel, they all would have been executed. This time, however, he was peaceful. He was relaxed in his mood and in his spirit. And when he called the seers to his palace, he was only too happy to tell them the details of his dream. There were no tests. And then they would merely be responsible to interpret it. But when the experts in the several different fields of the Chaldean black arts, the magicians, the sorcerers, the, the seers, and so on, were told the dream, they were at a loss. They were at a loss to know its meaning. And after their failure, the king called for Daniel. And as we see, he was able to tell the king the meaning of his latest dreams and visions. Now, interestingly, scholars and Bible commentators have had a difficult time with these opening passages. Because they ask, why would the king have called his Chaldean seers first? And then only later would he have called in Daniel. Their answers vary. But the most popular one is that several years had passed, the king had forgotten about Daniel and the dream statue. Others say the king would not have called his Chaldean seers at all, but would have immediately summoned Daniel. So all this is, is good storytelling that heightens the suspense. And it once again elevates the Jewish Daniel. I can't agree with either of these views because I think the answer is clear and logical. The pagan king had a dream. And although it was somewhat disturbing, there was nothing about it that wouldn't have been familiar from his pagan worldview. The use of trees as metaphors for power and for a few other reasons was commonplace. The appearance of an angelic being was usual in Babylonian theology. Further, since several years had passed, since his famous dream statue dream, no doubt the king had had many other dreams and these same Chaldean seers had given him satisfactory answers as to their interpretation. Most of the great king's dreams were just dreams, like we all, all have almost every night. But in that era, all dreams were thought to have meaning. And when a king had a dream, especially one that seemed unusually poignant and repetitive, his thought was that because of his lofty position, the outcome of the dream was especially important because it could affect his entire kingdom. So he needed answers. Thus he had a ready team of folks to call upon who were trained in these matters. And no doubt they were called upon regularly. Now what's interesting is that in this matter of the tree dream of chapter 4, his regular team of Chaldean seers had no answer. Why? What stumped them? I think the matter's clear. This was a true message to the king from the God of Israel. It was not a run-of-the-mill nighttime dream. How would non-believers be able to make heads nor tails of it if it was from God. Thus we can surmise that back in chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar relented and told the Chaldeans the content of his... Uh, uh, had, uh, let me back up. Had he told them the content of his dream at the outset, they still wouldn't have been able to interpret it. Because it was a message from Jehovah. So in verse 5, Chapter 4, after his usual seers can't interpret his dream, the king no doubt figures that the source of this tree dream must have been the same as the one for the statue dream. So he calls in the Hebrew Daniel, who communed with this particular God, who imparts those kinds of dreams. Now notice something key about chapter 4. This is really important to get. We have Nebuchadnezzar doing the speaking. And he's doing it in the first person. In other words, the king himself is being quoted and 
He's the one telling the story. Thus, we're getting this narrative entirely from his point of view. It's going to be told in his vernacular. It's going to be described in terms familiar to him within his pagan Babylonian culture and theology. Very key. So he calls Daniel Belshazzar, the new Babylonian name in the Aramaic language that Daniel was given seven, uh, several years earlier when he first arrived in Babylon. And while the meaning of this name isn't agreed upon, it's no doubt a combination of the chief Babylonian god's name, which is Bel, and the word Chatzar then is attached. Some say it means Bel protects his life. Rashi says Chetzar is a Babylonian expression of unknown meaning. Further, it seems that the never-ending change to the pecking order of the gods has again evolved. And as of now, Nebuchadnezzar openly says Bel is his god. And whether that means it's his personal god, or that Bel is the national god of Babylon, that's probably most likely. Or that Bel is currently considered the most high god, the El, or in Aramaic, the Ile. None of this is entirely clear. Either way, Daniel has been renamed after the god Bel. And then Nebuchadnezzar says that Daniel has in him the spirit of the holy gods. Now, what does he mean by this? Again, scholars disagree on it. Some say the phrase is not the spirit of the holy gods, plural, but rather it is spirit of the holy god, singular. That is, that the king is saying that Daniel has in him the spirit of the god of Israel who gives and interprets these dreams. But that is far too monotheistic and, and a Hebrew viewpoint to be ascribing to a Gentile king who has just pronounced that his own god is Bel. And further, the sense of the Aramaic word Kaddish, which is typically translated to English as holy, more has the sense of meaning divine than holy. Because in Babylonian theology, the word is equally applied to angels and to gods, especially if they are good gods. So we don't want to cloud this matter by, by inserting the English word holy, which, which creates in us a specific mental picture, especially for Christians and Jews. And it's usually applied exclusively to the Lord and to the Lord's activities. Therefore, the king's intent is that he recognizes Daniel as having a special and intimate connection to certain gods that are among the good gods. Gods that look favorably upon Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. So in verse 6, the king continues by calling Belshazzar, Daniel, the chief of magicians. And indeed, we learned earlier in the book of Daniel that the king had put Daniel in charge of his Chaldean seers, at least the ones who lived in Babel. So, chief of the magicians was more or less Daniel's formal title, and it's not to be taken as a compliment or as flattery. It was just the fact. Thus, convinced that Daniel's the one to interpret his dream because Daniel was connected to the right god or gods, the king sets about telling him his dream about this tree. Now, the complete Jewish Bible says the tree grew strong, uh, grew rather and became strong, a past event that was completed. But in fact, the grammar is in the imperfect. So it means that the dream tree was still growing and getting taller and getting stronger. It was located at the center of the earth, wherever that was perceived by the king to be, and it had grown so high that it reached the sky, or probably better, to the heavens. 
The tree seems to have stood apart by itself, not in the midst of a forest of other trees. And I suspect that for Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon was the center of the earth. And in later prophecies, including in Revelation, Babylon is seen as the center of the earth as far as the Gentile world is concerned. As far as commerce and governmental power is concerned. The idea of every person over the entire planet, or at least throughout the Babylonian Empire, being able to see this amazingly tall and majestic tree means that the tree affects everyone who seeks its shelter. And that at the least, everyone earth, on earth is aware of the existence of this powerful, this unmatched tree. Thus we read of those who eat of its limitless fruit. We read of birds that live in its endless branches, of the wild animals that use it as shade for protection from the harsh elements. So while the tree and its benefits are available to everyone, not all creatures will avail themselves of it. So far, there really isn't anything in this scene to cause fear or disquiet in the king. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar says he sees a holy watcher coming down from heaven in order to pronounce an oracle. It was the subject and the content of the oracle that was terrifying, not the enormity of the tree. What's a holy watcher? Once more, don't be thinking in Hebrew or in Christian terms. While, the king, while what the king saw was certainly something brought about by the God of Israel, and so in that sense, this holy watcher was not only real, but divinely sent, the king could only recognize it and think of it and name it in terms of his Babylonian theology. Let me tell you what I mean by that and why, why that concept shouldn't trouble us at all. <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, John gave us visions of the future, especially that of a period typically called the Tribulation and then the end of days and then Armageddon. <clears throat> and what he tells us, he tells us in terms of of the Hebrew culture and of the world conditions of his day and he describes things that he sees in ways that his mind can make any sense of them. For instance, in Revelation 9, we read these familiar passages in verses 7 through 10. Now these locusts look like horses outfitted for battle and on their heads were what looked like crowns of gold and their faces were like human faces, and they had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like those of lions. Their chests were like iron breastplates, and the sound of their rings was made like the roar of horses and chariots rushing into battle. And they had tails like those of scorpions with stings, and in their tails was the power to hurt people for five months. A little bit later in that same chapter, in verses 17 through 19, here's how the horses looked in the vision. The writers had breastplate, pray, breastplates that were fire red, iris blue, and sulfur yellow. The horses' heads were like lions' heads, and from their mouths issued fire, smoke, and sulfur. It was these three plagues that killed a third of mankind. The fire, smoke, and sulfur issuing from these horses' mouths. For the power of the horses was in their mouths and also in their tails. For their tails were like snakes with heads, and with them they could cause injury. Okay. I think it's close to unanimous in theological circles that what's being spoken of are modern-day weapons in some cases, perhaps bioengineered creatures in another case. And so John may have been envisioning a, a, a tank battle or, or some attack helicopters or militarized genetic modifications or even chemical warfare, but how could he possibly make sense of it. 
How could he possibly find the words for things that wouldn't exist for at least 2,000 years? Things that there's just no vocabulary that he had to describe. So he used metaphors. He used metaphors. He used illustrations that reminded him, for instance, of horses. But they weren't horses. They were like horses. Things that had tails like scorpions. But they were neither tails nor probably were they scorpions. He's telling us the unvarnished truth as best his mind could comprehend it in an ancient world only a few decades removed from Christ's crucifixion. It was the same for Nebuchadnezzar. He sees something. Oh, it's real. But it's of a spiritual nature. He sees all that in his tree dream. But the Babylonian concept of the spiritual world is quite different from the Hebrew and the biblical concept of the spiritual world. So he naturally uses his own familiar Babylonian cultural terms to sense it, to express it, because he doesn't have anything else to go on. So what we have here is essentially a game of intercultural, if not interfaith, charades. And now Daniel must untangle it, and so must we now. At this point, there's an abrupt change in the narrative. Up to now, the king has been explaining what he saw in the visions and in the dreams. But beginning in verse 11, he begins quoting, directly quoting, what some kind of strange being in his dream said to him in his dream. A being that Nebuchadnezzar calls a holy watcher. And this holy watcher pronounces his decree regarding the tree of the king's dream. The decree is, cut it down, remove the leaves, scatter its fruit, remove the habitat for the creatures that live in its branches, eliminate the food supply of those who depend upon it. But the magnificent tree is not to be destroyed entirely, nor permanently. A stump of the tree is to be left intact so that its roots can live. And now, and this is important, so that the tree can regenerate. The command from the Holy Watcher which is in reality an angel of God, no doubt, is not actually to cut it down, but rather the declaration is, it shall be cut down. In other words, the angel is not commanding somebody in particular, for instance the king, or maybe some other angelic beings, to cut down the tree. Rather, it is just a message that the tree will be felled. At some point. It's an impersonal message to all who hear it. Now further, the remaining tree stump will have bands of iron and bronze placed around it. Now there's some issue as to whether this is speaking of one band of metal that's made of both iron and bronze or whether it's two separate bands, one of iron, the other one of bronze. From a purely logical viewpoint, it's hard to argue for one band of mixed metal, since bronze already is a mixture of iron and copper. So for me, it's hard to make sense of thinking it is one band. I surmise that it's two bands. The stump is going to be left in fertile soil. It's going to be left with water provided from the sky, so it will have the nutrients it needs to survive and then to regrow. But since it's being left in the countryside, then the stump will share the same type of wildlife existence as do the animals of the field. Now verse 13 then says, referring to the stump, let his heart and mind cease to be human rather to take on the nature of an animal. Now I remind you 
This is Nebuchadnezzar recounting his dream to Daniel blow by blow. But he doesn't yet know what it means, and we haven't been yet given an interpretation. So, for the moment, calling the stump he is a little strange. And then saying that this stump is going to have his mind exchanged for an animal mind also adds to the mystery, which of course shall be shortly solved. But then comes another part of the verse, that by the time we're through with this chapter, still, I'm afraid, will not give us a definitive answer that we can hang our hats on. It says, and let seven seasons pass over him. At least that's what it says in the complete Jewish Bible. This is the period of time that the stump's mind will become an animal mind, and that the stump will live an animal existence. Other versions say let seven years pass over him. A couple of versions even say let seven months pass over him. But the most literal translation is let seven times pass over him. And we're going to deal with this more in a few more verses, but for now just understand that the words seasons, or years, or months, do not appear here. Rather, those are terms that various modern, modern editors decided that a time ought to amount to. So, they removed the word times, and they substituted their own term. But also understand that the number seven does matter here in this context since this is a vision from God. And even though it was given to a non-believer, and since it is a heavenly messenger delivering God's message, then the use of the number seven denotes that indeed what is happening is divinely ordered, and that seven means what it usually means, completion in an idealistic way. The divine messenger, called a holy watcher by Nebuchadnezzar, concludes his announcement by saying that what was decreed is also unchangeable. And that the purpose is so that Nebuchadnezzar and really all of mankind might be led to recognize the immutable sovereignty of the Most High over all kingdoms therefore over all kings. This El, the Ele God, controls everything from on high, and he will give dominion over the earth, and over its nations, and over its kingdoms, to whomever he likes. No king can be a king without his permission. No king can remain a king without his blessing. No one can decide for the Most High who shall be a king, nor from what class of society they'll come from. And King Nebuchadnezzar says that this is the entire dream, and that none of his Babylonian seers could figure it out, but that he has every confidence that Daniel can because he's spiritually connected to the holy gods who seem to be giving the king this dream. And beginning in verse 16, verse 19 in some versions, Daniel interprets, but keep in mind that what we have is the king, in his own words, recounting what Daniel said. That is just like he recounted what the holy watcher told him in his dream, now as the story continues, the king is still narrating. So he is telling us what it is that Daniel said to him. And the sentence structure is a little bit awkward, but I have no doubt that it's because some later editor had his hand in this, and, and the fact that we have several ancient Daniel manuscripts that word this passage slightly differently attests to that fact. No matter which version, however, the thrust is the same, and there's no disagreement or conflicts among the versions except regarding 
what I would call grammatical minutia. Daniel's loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel likes Nebuchadnezzar. He wishes him well. And his loyalty stems not only from the fact that he and his Jewish cohorts and the Jewish exile population in Babylon are being treated decently, but also because Daniel knows that this king is God's choice and God has given him dominion over the earth for three generations. So when Daniel hears this dream, he at once understood. He was awestruck and it shocked him to his soul. It was unexpected and it wasn't good news. He must tell the king, however, forthrightly and honestly this harsh truth. Divine judgment upon the king was imminent. The king instantly saw that Daniel was distressed. He told him not to back out because of fear. Now you see, this was a wise king. He knew that his Chaldean seers typically wanted the king to be pleased with their dream interpretations. They tended to tell the king what they thought he wanted to hear so that he could feel more secure. But they also wanted to keep their lives and their lofty positions. So in verse 17, Daniel swallows hard and he begins to recite what God told him that the dream meant. That gigantic tree is King Nebuchadnezzar. But we also have to remember that in some respects, a king and his kingdom are one, inseparable. So the vision of the tree is about Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Although, as we'll see, in the immediate impact concerns just primarily the king. Further, in verse 19, Daniel agrees with the king that the king's greatness is unapproachable on earth and that the entire earth is under his rule and dominion. But see, but this is a spiritual heavenly viewpoint. It's not a physical earth, uh, earthly reality such as the viewpoint that the king holds. There's much more on earth than the Babylonian Empire, which of course is what the king rules over. However, at this moment, what happens anywhere on earth, the Lord is harmonizing with the rule and the dominion of Nebuchadnezzar. So from that aspect, everyone on the planet is affected by Nebuchadnezzar, who is the tree in the dream. But now the bad news. Since he's the tree, he's about to get chopped down. He's going to lose his power, lose his dominion. And after a brief repeat in verse 20 of the king's dream, in verse 21, Daniel makes clear something that the king had misunderstood in his dream. The king seemed to think that this holy watcher was not only a messenger, but the one who had decree, uh, created the decree. In Babylonian theology, Angels were more independent from the gods than they are in biblical Hebrew theology. Angels could indeed decide upon a mission and carry it out on their own, but not so with the angels of Jehovah. So Daniel tells the king, no, no, it's the decree of the Most High that has come upon my Lord the king. Or adding in an Aramaic word, it is the decree of the Elay that has come upon my Lord the King. Now, before we close for the day, I want to make a point that's thorny, not necessarily popular, because it steps on a lot of traditions. I'm doing this to give you food for thought, and it's a point I think we all need to uh, contemplate and consider because until recently, it really didn't seem all that important. All throughout chapter 4, we see the constant mention of the term Most High, Hebrew El, Aramaic Elay. Belshazzar, Daniel, 
uses the term, and Nebuchadnezzar uses the same term. But I promise you that the mental picture that each man had of the Most High and just who that is was quite different. That's because Ile, Most High, is a title. It's not a personal name. It's like our term president or prime minister or king or even mister. These are titles for an office, not the name of the office holder. We don't know who exactly we're talking about until we add the person's name that holds that office. As anyone who has lived past 20 years knows, all presidents and prime ministers and kings aren't the same. They have different sets of attributes, strengths, and weaknesses. They adhere to widely varying ideologies and morals and ethics, and they operate on differing principles. So to refer to the Ile, the Most High, is incomplete. In a certain respect, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar were just talking right by each other. Daniel probably realized that. But I can't imagine that Nebuchadnezzar did. He was oblivious. That is why I tell you, and anyone who has the ears to hear, that there's only two ways to know God. His name and his attributes. God is a title. It's an office. Like president or king. God is not a name. The correct response to somebody who says, God ought to be, oh, which God? What's his name? See, today especially, we can add to that What's his attributes and characteristics? And if he has a holy book, what is it? I'm sorry to say that so many Christians and Jews are oblivious to the reality that within modern mainstream Judea Christianity especially is a movement to accept any name, to accept any set of characteristics for who it is that holds the office of God. And the catalyst for this seems to be an exaggerated and out-of-balance desire to evangelize Muslims. Of course they need to hear the gospel. The problem is the desire is so great among many denominations and missionary organizations that, that, that just like with Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, both sides accept talking to one another concerning the Most High, but they really only wind up agreeing that there is an office called Most High. There is God. Who precisely occupies that office is talked around. And his characteristics are generally either discarded or simply reduced to over simplicity, such as God is love. So they can be assigned to any number of possible office holders. That is why, in what is loosely called today the emergent church, which is really just a new name for the liberal church, that the term Muslim Christian has gained acceptance and it seems to go almost unchallenged. A Muslim Christian is defined as a Muslim who remains loyal to Islam at one level or another, but who also has a belief in Jesus and has expressed a commitment to follow his instructions, at least from a philosophical standpoint. However, this person does not believe in the deity of Jesus, does not believe that Jesus died and rose from the grave, and does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah and saves. The two holy books of the Koran and the Bible are seen as co-equal. Jerusalem, therefore, ought to be the co-capital. 
of both Islam and Judeo-Christianity. And the foundation of the problem is this. Many Christians and most Jews no longer want to give a name to the office holder of the office of God. And they don't want to expound upon his well-defined attributes and characteristics. Because if that happened, there would be no way to have such a thing as a Muslim Christian. Such supposed middle ground suddenly disappears because it was all a mirage to begin with. Now, I could go on and on about this issue, but what I want to leave here today, I want to leave it with you, is the importance of knowing the difference between a title and a name. And why God's name and his attributes are so terribly important for us to know and to understand and for us to be able to explain to others. And it is why as believers we must not allow any other name, any other set of attributes to be assigned to the office of God the Most High regardless of the personal cost. Please rise.